morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for Remaking the Warehouse, Carbon Reduction, and the Future of Logistics Centers, Warehousing, and Fulfillment. This is our second of four webinars in our Decarbonizing America webinar series. My name is Bobby Deschel, and I'm an attorney at Moy White in our Advanced Energy Group. Moy White is a full-service law firm offering strategic representation in complex commercial transactions and disputes. Our clients include startups and Fortune 100 enterprises, tax-exempt organizations, and associations. Moy White is dedicated to furthering renewable and advanced energy in our home state of Colorado and across the nation. Our team focuses on renewable and advanced energy projects and provides representation for renewable and next generation energy producers, developers, and manufacturers. To learn more about Moy White's advanced energy team, visit moywhite.com. During our first webinar, we laid the groundwork for each building sector and reviewed case studies on delivering zero carbon at zero cost premium. You can view this webinar through the newsroom section of our website at moywhite.com. Our third webinar, which will occur later this summer, will focus on how to retrofit buildings and building portfolios to substantially reduce our impact and reach zero carbon emissions. Today, I'm excited to welcome four leaders in the field to guide us through the future of warehousing and challenge our thinking on its current state, what can be reinvented, and how we can be prepared for the future. First, Sarah Spencer Workman will guide us through resiliency and remaking the warehouse, laying out some of our current challenges and how we can adapt, build, and operate to meet them. Sarah is a manager for McKinstry who leads a team of professionals to build partnerships and deliver projects focused on executing high-performance buildings. Sarah is a solution strategist driving decarbonization, resiliency, occupant health, and sustainability through her 20-year career. As a manager, she orchestrates a strategic focus on developing diversity, equity, and inclusion within the organization as a co-chair of McKinstry Women's Alliance. Sarah is a graduate of the University of Colorado, University of Massachusetts, and Yale University. Next, we'll hear from Mike Roth, who will go over zero emission trucking, what can happen when something leaves the dock doors, and how this may shape the future of warehousing. Mike has worked in the commercial vehicle industry for over 35 years, is the executive director of the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, and is the trucking lead for RMI. Mike's specialty is brokering green truck collaborative technologies into the real world at scale. He is a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from The Ohio State University and a Master's in Organizational Leadership from the Indiana Institute of Technology. Roth served on the second National Academy of Sciences Engineering Medicine Committee on reducing fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions of medium and heavy duty vehicles, is a Department of Energy Merit Reviewer and served as Chairman of the Board for the Truck Manufacturers Association. He understands the customers, operations, and intricacies of the commercial vehicle industry, having held various positions in product development, engineering, reliability and quality, sales, and plant management with Navistar and Bear Cummins. We'll then hear from Paul Hiley, who will zero in on what's truly needed to revitalize our warehouse spaces. Paul is the electrical engineering manager for McKinstry. He leads a team of diverse professionals supporting McKinstry's pursuits across multiple offices located throughout the United States. Paul is a graduate of the University of Idaho and is a licensed as a professional engineer in 49 states. Last, but certainly not least, Daniel Theobald will go through how robotics is transforming the inside of our warehouse operations and what this means for the future. Daniel is the founder and chief innovation officer of Vecna Robotics, uh, the, automate, the autonomous mobile robot and workflow orchestration company and co-founder and president of Mass Robotics. Daniel has decades of experience leading research scientists and teams of engineers in developing cutting edge technology. He has 67 issued patents and more than 30 patents pending. Daniel has been on the forefront of robotics for more than 20 years, working closely with DARPA, DOD, NASA, NIH, USDA, and many others to advance the use of robotics and AI software to improve supply chain automation. In addition to the founding Vecna Robotics, Daniel also co-founded Mass Robotics, a nonprofit dedicated to the global advancement of the robotics industry. Daniel is dedicated to the idea that technology can be used to empower people worldwide to live more fulfilling lives. And with that, I'll kick it over to Sarah to get us started. Thanks, Bobby, and welcome, everyone. Um, so we'll talk to you a little bit this morning about resiliency as we remake the warehouse. Real estate investors and financial institutions are starting to recognize climate risk as an important gap in their pricing considerations and investments. And really, there's two risks that come about when they talk through this. Physical risk, climate change risks that directly impact real estate assets and markets, such as storms, floods, sea level rise, wildfires, extreme temperatures, and drought. 
And then transition risk, which really is about shifts in policy and perception related to climate change adaptation that can impact these real estate investment decisions along the regulatory changes, litigation, reputational damage, and even technology changes. So at McKinstry, we are committed to innovating to change the footprint of the built environment across America. It is one of our three major pillars where we've pledged our commitment going forward around carbon, carbon and climate and dealing with the crisis at hand. Next slide, please. So what is resiliency? The definition of resiliency can mean different things to different audiences. But for today's conversation, we're really focusing on the capacity of a community, business, or natural environment to prevent, withstand, and respond to and recover from a disruption. I think the most recent disruption that all of us have experienced recently is COVID-19 and the impact that the pandemic has had on our businesses, communities, and overall environment. Next slide. When we talk about the built environment and the impact it has, we're really looking at about approximately 40% of the emissions coming from that. Um, we look at everything from 29% in transportation, 25% electricity generation, 23% industry, and about 10% agriculture, 7% commercial, and 6% residential. So why are we here? The warehouse and logistics building sector is booming. It's always been a vital um, element of of our commerce, but with the increase, increasing shift to online warehouses that are no longer just storage centers, they're becoming distribution points. So this shift has primarily been driven by stricter legislation on energy efficiency, design, and carbon reduction. And so when we take a, a look at that 40% number, it becomes pretty impactful in a warehouse real estate environment. Next slide, please. So warehouses and large use commercial spaces are really facing the inability to be resilient due to things like liability for pollutants, supply chain deficiencies, legal problems, damage to brand or image, public perception, unattainable in certain markets, high operation costs. There's definitely a lack of the ability for warehouse spaces to channel resources efficiently and effectively towards activities that will reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, indoor particulate matter and pathogens, and there's definitely a strong need to optimize the supply chain efficiencies, financial investment in these large scale buildings to combat the climate change and carbon footprint, um, deal with things like rising air ambient air temperatures and reduce indoor air quality. Leading with an adaptation strategy and vision which articulates equitably for protecting people and resources in the long term to overcome these liabilities will be significant to the resiliency of a warehouse space. And ongoing monitoring and adapting to operational costs as a result of the climate crisis over time with reporting results and key performance metrics to combat ongoing, ongoing climate risk and decarbonization will be significant to success. Finally, building better for climate and improving occupant health will be a mainstay of becoming a resilient warehouse. Next slide, please. So moving beyond mitigation, which is typically kind of the norm in which we start, when we talk about decarbonization or carbon footprint and large scale uses like warehouses, let's go into resiliency. And putting resiliency in action is closer than we actually think. So not all warehouses are able to adapt to sustainability at scale. However, there are several options when we talk about heating and cooling and other things that can have significant impact on the energy use and therefore carbon emissions with various energy efficiency versions of familiar technologies on the market today. Attention is often focused on the steps businesses take to mitigate climate change, reducing or preventing emissions of greenhouse gases or removing carbon from the atmosphere in order to limit the magnitude of the future. However, we're closer than we think. So looking at employee performance satisfaction and retention is one of the key parts of looking towards a resilient future. Really thinking about the values that are important to the employee working in that space, the thermal comfort of the employee, increasing views and daylights as they relate to any type of office integration in a warehouse space, noise reduction and pollution, making it quieter, and obviously talking about indoor air quality has become a very significant part of the resiliency in any indoor occupied space, especially in warehouses over the last year. Durability, both in economic times and political times, will be important to the resiliency of that warehouse space, but more importantly, making sure that they're able to, you're able to withstand the economic and political changes during some times of transition and real estate risk. And power operability will be important. So how do we actually operate these spaces when power is 
least functioning or not available, um, considering things like battery storage, off-grid, um, things of that nature will be super important. And then finally, what we call overall climate future proofing. So we really want to take a look at kind of the five basic principles around getting to climate future proofing when we talk about resiliency in warehouse space, such as energy efficiency being the most basic um, to the most complicated uh, around renewables, off-grid storage, um, and lots more around kind of building on more than passive um, efficiencies. Next slide, please. So overall, I, you know, I think what I'd like to leave you with as we move into these next experts is climate resilience offers businesses a stark choice. We either want to prepare now for resiliency or we're going to have to end up paying later. And on that note, I'll pass it to Mike. Hello, everybody. Thanks. Uh, that was very uh, good kickoff. Um, I'm going to talk not so much about the warehouse but about where we're headed with uh, zero emission trucks and, and primarily um, electric trucks. So let's move on. This is the, the uh, organization. We've done a, a good bit of work in this space around, you know, kind of, we call it electric trucks myth or, or reality. And, and we've, um, and me even personally, when I first started looking at electric trucks, I'm like, yeah, right, you know, batteries all freight. Um, that won't happen in my career or maybe ever. And I was really wrong. Um, they are here and coming quickly and going to impact a, a bunch of us. So NACFI.org is where you can find a lot of, uh, of information at no charge um, um, given our sponsorship. So move on. Uh, as you know, kind of summarizing where we're going to see electric trucks with, with respect to the warehousing, we're definitely going to see it move from the inside outward. So um, a lot of forklifts are already electrified. Um, we are seeing uh, a, a, an electrification in the terminal or yard tractors moving trailers around these warehouses and depots. Uh, and that is um, ha happening as we speak. And actually that yard tractor is gonna be a, a, a real good beachhead for electrification of regional haul tractors that I get into in a minute. Uh, Medium duty urban delivery. So these are e-commerce deliveries as well as uh, intra-city movement, you know, box trucks and that sort of thing. Um, there's a very strong case already for those being electric uh, for a lot of uh, cost and, uh, you know, soft cost and environmental reasons. Um, port drayage, uh, you know, an interesting um, uh, application where they're really replacing the oldest of the trucks that are out there on the road where, you know, we always say in trucking, you know, uh, for, for drayage, that's where trucks go to die in their second or third life. And, and that's being, uh, you know, turned on upside down with a lot of uh, zero emission trucks being looked at in drayage. And then ultimately, and we'll see where it goes, but those long haul trucks um, travel in the country uh, will be particularly challenging for, for electrification, but possibly hydrogen fuel cells. Next. Uh, this regional hall or middle mile is a, is an emerging sector. So uh, this is something that's been around trucking for a long time. This is sort of the out and back, uh, you know, day cab tractors that um, tend to return, you know, kind of the, the classic sort of hub and spoke logistics that we've talked about for decades and wondered really whether or not it was going to to uh, to expand and to, to take off. And we believe quite firmly that it has for lots of reasons both from a sort of a push and a pull. So from a push, uh, you know, we've got new technologies that allow us to know where the tractor is, the trailer is, the driver is, the freight is. Once we know those four elements, you know, we can more organize and dedicate and formalize that freight movement. So instead of trucks having the sort of this chaotic all around the country, truckers not knowing where they're going to deliver or sleep uh, in these sleeper trucks, we are seeing a movement to more known specific routes and from a pull standpoint um you know drivers like to be home every night they don't like to sleep in the trucks and eat in a truck stop uh and then from an alternative fuels and particularly electric trucks if we know where that route is we know where the beginning is and the ending is we can more confidently put the electric charging in place for these electric trucks next and, and so this regional, we've been looking at it in a lot of different ways. I, I don't have enough time to go into the detail, but we, we actually did a pretty significant event in 2019, looking at this middle mile regional. And we had 10 tractors and trailers that we that we did sort of a reality TV show event. It was like um, a month of data that we collected. And we learned a lot about these trucks going maybe, 
you know, distribution center to warehouse or fulfillment center, a lot of terms there. Um, but this sort of, uh, you know, manufacturing to depots and all that. And, and what we learned uh, was a lot, including like lower left there, a bunch of different routes that these trucks take. Uh, but at the end of the day, we do see this growing and um, uh, gives us a lot of design flexibility. And I think will impact uh, the growth in these warehouses, um, but it will have an effect on them. And when I say effect, I think it comes down to, to maybe, uh, maybe three kind of really key big ones. And that is one that charging will be needed uh, at or near uh, many of these warehouses. Um, so whether that's home base for the truck and the driver, or whether it's a, it's a, it's a charge once they get there while it's being unloaded or during a driver break. The second one is automation. So if we really do know and can predict that that same truck's going to make that same route day in and day out, that could be a place for driverless trucks where that truck, um, you know, might get to the warehouse, uh, you know, without a driver, or maybe it has a driver getting to the warehouse, but the uh, movements around the yards backing into the, the, the docks and so forth are uh, auto automated. And lastly, I think these electric trucks offer a huge opportunity where the trucks may come into the warehouse. So if you think about, you know, UPS, FedEx um, and others where those, those, those cars or those, you know, vans come into the warehouse, if we can come into the warehouse with no emissions, uh, that opens up, you know, less, less exhaust systems in these warehouses, as well as um, uh, better uh, uh, air quality inside and, and lower cost, better, better air conditioning, heating, et cetera. Next. Uh, this is just a, uh, like a library of the electric truck work we've done. So um, just uh, NACFI.org and emerging technologies, you can find it if you really want to dig into uh, some of what we believe around um, where, when, how, and uh, what are the benefits and consequences of these zero emission trucks. Next. And I'm going to close with um, an effort we have going on right now, which will help with uh, electric trucks. And here in 2021, we have 13 fleets that are deploying real electric trucks right now that we are highlighting. And uh, we're in the middle of site visits to all of them, videos that we're conducting with the drivers and the maintenance people and so forth. And um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, you know, in the last two weeks, I have been in, uh, this is the schedule for that effort where um, the, the month of September for three weeks is where we'll be highlighting all these electric trucks and so forth. But, and you can go to the next slide. Um, what I wanted to mention here is over the last three weeks, um, I've been in uh, warehouses where these electric trucks are operating. So mo the, the visits I did in the last couple of weeks were out in, and, and a couple of my team members were out in California at Biagi Brothers with, you know, a million square feet of, of, of wine, um, Penske, Anheuser-Busch, uh, you know, we're doing NFI and others. But the, the keys here is to be able to, you know, charge the truck, have the, the, the space to charge the truck um, at those warehouses and distribution centers and, um, and then take advantage of the clean air and the, um, the, what, what they're bringing. So with that, I'll close and um, um, might have a slide or two more, but um, I'll take some questions um, as yeah, just a summary slide. Uh, but um, I'll take some questions later or if anybody wants to reach out to, to me or us, we'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Turn it over to Paul, who's going to talk about uh, revitalizing warehouse, warehouse spaces. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, great introduction. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Paul Hiley. As I've been introduced, I'm going to talk a little bit about revitalizing warehouse spaces. And a lot of times what happens with uh, these existing spaces is we have a lot of very intelligent, high-level thinkers. They come up with ideas. They drop it on the engineering desk and say, hey, figure out how to make this work. Um, and we love that challenge. But one of the things we see with existing warehouse space and what's a coming trend is a high degree of automation inside these warehouses. And Daniel, I'm sure is gonna talk a little bit about that, but with this high level of automation, uh, we're gonna have an increased demand for automation, an increased demand for reliable and resilient uh, power, and as well as a high degree or high amount of data that needs to be available. <clears throat> so as you're looking at existing spaces, we also wanna look at the comm infrastructure and how we get this data from these warehouses out into the cloud usable for the companies that are gonna be in there. Next slide, please. As Mike alluded to, we are seeing a very large breaking wave across the country and it's gonna get even larger towards uh, electric vehicles. Uh, the debate a few years ago used to be what model of Tesla should I go out and order? And now it's, you know, there's dozens of electric vehicles coming on the market and the large freight companies are all coming online with trucks that can go regional and long haul distances. 
With that though comes a need at these warehouse spaces for these trucks to be able to recharge and the capacity in most of these warehouse spaces is just not big enough to accommodate large scale EV recharging. So that's one of the things we need to look at with these warehouse spaces to upsize and revamp their electrical distribution. Next slide. One of the big things we also see is the need for renewables, as I think we've talked about with other webinars. Uh, on the left is a photo of a warehouse that looks great. A uh, lot of flat open roof area, a lot of natural daylight with skylights, but we want what we want to get to transition to is a rooftop with PV and renewable energy, and that has some challenges. A lot of warehouse space just does not have structural capacity in the roof to support large scale EV deployment sometimes, so we have to come up with some innovative solutions and in how to get there. And we also need the utility infrastructure in place to take advantage of the PV and EV fleet so that we can have a two way exchange of power between the utility company and the EV and the power being produced at these sites to get it on the grid to make it more resilient to make it more useful. Next slide. Some of that is going to revolve around putting out uh, battery storage at sites. Uh, it kind of makes sense if we're going to go out and upgrade warehouse spaces with multi megawatt services and capacity for EV charging to start working with your utility companies to think that, think about them as distributed generation uh, sites and put in battery storage. And there's a lot of battery storage systems coming online more and more every day. That's a very uh, large market that's coming out and utility companies are looking at better ways to deploy those regionally to use them as distributed resources. The other option there on the right is a photo of some canopy PV systems where if we can't get enough PV on a rooftop or the rooftop structure just doesn't have the capacity to support it, let's look at some different ideas for putting PV on those spaces that may involve some sort of carport. Next. Uh, a little bit more on solar counties. We can leverage open parking spots. They're highly visible. People like being able to see that the industry is using PV and the rechargeable. Um, the little bit higher cost to put this up there, but sometimes if you have existing warehouse spaces, that can't support it on the roof, this is a great option. Next. Uh, a little bit of cost comparison between ground mount, rooftop, solar, and parking garage, uh, just to kind of go over where you may have to be thinking if you're looking at existing warehouse spaces on how do I get PV out of this site. Next slide, please. One of the biggest factors in dealing with revitalizing warehouse spaces is getting to your utility company and sitting down with them to talk about different strategies of how to get more power to these locations and working with them in public private partnerships to come up with innovative rate structures that can benefit the private sector as well as the utility company. So there's going to be a nationwide crunch with utilities to deal with electrification, to deal with EV infrastructure, uh, and to deal with global warming global warming, excuse me, and all those are being pushed upon a depleted utility grid that is seeing stresses probably unlike it's never seen before with everything that's going on. So getting with your local utility is going to be pretty key. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel to go over some robotics. Thank you. Great introduction to a lot of what's happening inside the warehouse right now with respect to automation. The next slide, please. Um, and one of the points I did want to highlight that uh, Paul made around uh, the infrastructure in the warehouse is the importance for that communication piece, particularly networking uh, and specifically wireless networking. Um, uh, you know, as we're deploying robots, uh, probably the biggest obstacle that our customers run into is lack of appropriate wireless infrastructure in their facilities. Um, and of course, that doesn't just support the robots, that supports the connected worker, et cetera, going forward. So that's certainly something to think about. So Vecna Robotics is the world leader in uh, automated forklifts um, is the easiest uh, one sentence description. Um, uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, we focus primarily on um, what I would call high capacity AMRs. AMR stands for Autonomous Mobile Robot, um, where we are carrying large loads like pallets or, or what are often referred to as non-conveyables. Um, but uh, the same conversation applies to robots of any, any type. 
And, um, you know, I don't have to uh, uh, read this slide to anybody. I think we've all experienced it. Uh, the, the world's supply chains are, are crucial to um, operations, uh, continued operations for all of our businesses and well being of our, our populations. And uh, disruptions to those supply chains can cause cascading effects that um, uh, uh, you know, really um, uh, test uh, our, our resilience. And so uh, thinking in the future about how we create this resilience that has been talked about, I think is, is a really important topic. Next slide. Um, one of the factors that I would like to bring forward is this miss perception that um, it's it's about robots versus human workers. Uh, uh, in the media, a lot of times we see, you know, this debate about robots taking jobs. Um, and in practice, uh, while it's understandable why people would think this, and obviously jobs is a very um, uh, important and, and oftentimes emotional issue, the fact of the matter is that companies that effectively deploy this type of automation almost universally hire more workers. Um, and, and that's simply because any technology from the beginning of time is about allowing us to achieve more with less, uh, allowing us to get more done. Um, and uh, I think one of the problems is that people often think about labor uh, as a zero sum game. And by that, what I mean is that there's only so much work to do. And if automation is doing some of it, then there's less for human workers. Um, the reality is that's not the case at all. Uh, you know, throughout human history, we've used technology to allow us to do more with less. And this is just continuing on that process. Um, so goal should not be generally to just get rid of the human workers and replace them with robots, but to really leverage the individual strengths of each. Um, it, it, uh, when you do it that way, there's a tremendous value proposition to be created. You know, Elon Musk um, had uh, came under a lot of heat when the Model 3 production was falling behind. Um, and he famously tweeted, um, we made a mistake, correction, I made a mistake. Uh, we tried to over automate, humans are, humans are underrated. I um, mean, and, and uh, really this idea of uh, using humans where humans are good and using automation where automation is good will ultimately provide you the best results long-term. Next slide. So um, a big part of uh, the idea around resilience is this idea of um, flexible versus infrastructure. Uh, you know, many of the customers that I visit, um, you'll oftentimes find miles and miles of conveyor uh, in the systems. And conveyor is a great tool. Um, it, it, can, it can be very efficient. Uh, uh, but one of the downsides of conveyor, and conveyor is not going away anytime soon. Um, I don't think ever will. It's, it's got a lot of pros. Um, but one of the downsides is it's infrastructure, it's built in, and you have to sort of design that infrastructure with a, an understanding of what's going to happen in the future. The challenge these days is the future is changing so quickly, uh, it gets really difficult to um, plan effectively. You know, it used to be that you could design your warehouse space and expect that it was going to operate essentially unchanged from the plan for, you know, over its depreciation time period, you know, or on the range of 10 years. That's just not the case anymore. We see customers that, you know, built an entire warehouse thinking they were going to use it for this. And then, you know, within a year, within even months, they realize that their business has changed substantially. So this idea of mobile equipment that can do the type of things that conveyor can do um, just provides a tremendous level of uh, flexibility that they didn't, uh, didn't have access to before. Um, so uh, when you talk about environmental impact and ROI, the, the matter of electrification, I think, was already covered quite well. Um, but, you know, typically these automated forklifts or other uh, um, autonomous mobile robots are electric vehicles. And um, the, the idea here, of course, is that uh, that 
just is um, much easier to automate. Internal combustion engines are great, but um, you know they 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 make that automation step much harder. So we anticipate um, uh, that you will see almost all equipment in the future um, be uh, you know either um, full electric or hydrogen fuel cell. We're working on a number of projects actually with large customers that are deploying significant number of hydrogen fuel cell. Um, uh, material handling equipment. And uh, one of the projects we're working on is being able to automatically refuel those as well. So automatic charging, the robots can automatically dock and recharge. They can automatically dock and refuel. Um, and so uh, a lot of really great things happening there. But one of the big points that I really wanna make on uh, the environmental side is that if you look at any warehouse or manufacturing environment, typically your resources are unutilized or underutilized anywhere from 30 to 60% of the time. Um, and that's largely driven by the limitation of human, you know, human workers. Uh, as automation comes in more and more, there are opportunities to make much better use of resources. And so uh, one of the clear needs that arises from this as you roll the clock forward is how do you orchestrate? How do you, how do you manage all of these different resources? So a big area that Vecna has been working on for decades is uh, this idea of making sure that you've got um, full transparency as to where everything is and what needs to get done. And then the ability to have AI basically help us to figure out where is the um, where should these resources be? It's all about getting the right resource in the right place at the right time. And as we make better use of our resources, we can see significant impacts and uh, positive impacts and throughput without uh, adding additional resources, which of course has great environmental impact. In one case study we did, just by better coordinating the resources the customer already had, they were able to double their throughput in the facility without adding any additional resources at all. Obviously that's great for business, great for the environment. Next slide. So um, this just can show some of that. Now these are numbers really uh, largely just based on putting automated equipment in place of sort of existing manual processes and the type of improvements you can get there. And what we showed was when you now take this as a, a foundation and then use um, better planning and orchestration, you can actually uh, um, uh, oftentimes uh, get a hundred percent increase uh, just based on um, uh, the number, you know, all, all these factors that I've mentioned. Next slide. So the key takeaways, um, flexibility is, is the sort of mantra that we hear in the market for our customers. Um, uh, designing a, a warehouse um, with you know, very um, sort of uh, strict understanding of how it's going to be used in the future is risky these days. So lean towards flexibility wherever you can. Uh, really important that we start deploying this kind of equipment because it does take time. The change management associated with this, with the staff, with the IT side, all of these things, they do take time. So my recommendation to everybody is, um, you know, choose a vendor and start working to deploy uh, this type of equipment. Um, there is a learning curve and you don't want to be in a situation where your, your competitors have figured out how to do this. And, uh, and you haven't. Um, really important to think about it in terms of empowering workers. Um, give them the information they need to make better choices. And again, this type of equipment can really help do that. And then uh, that allows us to uh, orchestrate. And the final note I'll leave you with is interoperability is super important. The robotics industry today is maybe where computing or, or um, mobile device industry was decades ago where, you know, there's sort of lots of vendors out there and everyone is kind of doing their own thing. One of the things that Mass Robotics is focusing on is trying to create practical, no-nonsense interoperability standards so that warehousing customers can buy with confidence 
um, and know that uh, the equipment they buy from one vendor will plug and play uh, and work uh, um, uh, collaboratively with the equipment from another vendor. Uh, so the mass robotics interoperability standard has been released. Uh, this is a recent uh, um, uh, step forward for the industry. I'd encourage uh, all warehouse designers to always look for the mass robotics interoperability badge in any uh, in any vendor or equipment that they're buying for that environment. Um, and that will just give you an open uh, API to be able to interact with these versus um, you know closed proprietary systems. And I think that's it for me. Well, thank you all uh, so much. If anyone has questions, please feel free uh, to pop them into the Q&A button located on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I'm happy to answer them. Just to uh, really start off, if there are if I'm an owner of an existing warehouse or I'm in the process of developing a warehouse, uh, for each of you, what is one item that you would prioritize in building our physical space? Uh, I can I can go first. Um, so I, I will give two. Again, I mentioned networking. Uh, good networking um, should be a primary consideration because as technology uh, and automation become more and more important in the warehouse, um, this flow of data is essentially the, the um, way that it all works. So, so really good networking is important. And, and then just thinking about the space layout. Robots, for example, do have different space requirements than human uh, operators, human uh, driven equipment, manually operated equipment. Um, and this is for safety. Um, it's not that the robots, uh, you know, can't drive as well as human beings. It's that our tolerance for uh, um, unsafe um, sort of operation of equipment from humans is much, much, much higher uh, than it is for unsafe operation of an autonomous system. And so the requirements around autonomous systems, uh, the safety has to really be a, a um, a verifiable, approvable thing. And what that means is that in many cases, you just need a little bit more space because you have to have standoff distances between that piece of autonomous equipment and that rack or that wall or that pedestrian walkway, whatever it is. Um, and uh, that, that's just a really important consideration. If you are just designing your warehouse, assuming that you know a human driver is gonna be able to squeak, you know, squeak a fork truck um, by, uh, that may work perfectly well for human drivers, but you're going to you're going to find that it's a choke point from a safety perspective uh, when you when you deploy autonomous uh, equipment. From the from the electrical capacity side, the first thing we're probably going to advise is let's see what do you want to do with that warehouse. What's the plan for EV charging and for automation, and go out and look at what capacity is available in your building. Um, and that can take some strategic planning because certain areas of the country, it doesn't take terribly too long to get new utility service, whereas other areas of the country, it can literally take years to get new utility service, depending on how much you need. So having a strategic approach about how you go about it and which facilities you might pick first to go after uh, should definitely be high on the list. Yeah, I think to Paul's point, prioritizing those facilities if you're an owner and you've got kind of multiple campuses that you own and operate. Um, one thing that we're looking at is leveraging a whole portfolio um, and trying to offset some of those um, carbon impacts around energy use intensity. We really see energy use intensity rising for um, these types of spaces, especially as we introduce additional technology um, and some other types of addressing, you know, some types of climate change as it results to air temperature rise or you know, smoke ventilation increase as a result of wildfires in the area, things like that. So, I mean, we would really take a look at kind of the foundation or the basic building blocks around, you know, is your warehouse space at the most energy efficient it could be? Um, and then identifying kind of areas and assets that could be improved. Uh, we'd also look at, you know, do you have some type of backup around power or electricity to Paul's point? Because um, it is difficult with some utility providers to get what you need. So if you have kind of a 
you know, an additional supplement around that, which anything renewables of any sort is usually a great idea. Um, but there are all, a lot of other options, including battery storage and things of that nature. And then finally, you know, making sure that that warehouse is, is um, kind of the, the building envelope itself is as functional as it can be is around, um, you know, really keeping what we want to keep in around your temperatures and controlling some of that thermal comfort or things of that nature um, and really sealing that building envelope up and making sure it's performing at its sort of its best and highest use. Um, we often find that rooftops get quite neglected um, and making sure those are most efficient as well um, in these types of spaces. So one of the challenges of being last is to come up with something unique and interesting that hasn't already been said. Um, and I think, you know, Daniel said a lot about safety around these automated vehicles inside the warehouse. The exact same thing holds true outside of the warehouse, whether it's these yard tractors or trucks, um, particularly if we go electric and automation where they're very quiet, um, you know, that, that, be, that becomes a real challenge. Um, I, I think... Uh, you know, something that hasn't been said that I'd like to bring up is urgency. So, you know, there are parts of the country um, uh, and North America who will go electric one, you know, a decade or more before other parts of the country, just because of air quality and regulations and, and, um, and, and, and geography and temperance for these electric trucks. So if you're in an area where it's coming fast, then you really start to need to consider where are we going to put these chargers? Who's going to pay for the charging infrastructure? Um, you know, oftentimes the people who are operating and owning the trucks are not, and trailers are, are the ones who don't operate and own the warehouse or the manufacturing plant where they got to come to charge at, uh, or maybe domicile that. A lot of trucks are domiciled at manufacturing plants and distribution centers that they, they don't own. So uh, how is that going to work? You know, is, do, do we have an extended contract for these electric truck operators or do we, or what? So um, um, I think prepare uh, and, and move if you're in an area where it's coming faster. And if you're not, um, maybe in an area that electric trucking will be a little farther down the road, then educate yourself and, and be ready to, to move when it happens. Well, thank you all. Certainly pretty straightforward issues for everyone to, to quickly address. Um, as we think about the built environment, um, and a lot of what we're talking about now is, is flexibility, um, and we have an existing building stock uh, of warehouses. Um, in some cities across America, we're seeing those be turned into breweries, bars, housing, et cetera. Um, do we need a new sort of, uh, building stock of warehouses to adjust for the future? Or can we innovate and rebuild within what currently exists, both technically and financially? Um, I'll take a title of the first part. I think I'm a big proponent of trying to reuse where we can, just because I think environmentally it's the right way to go. Uh, obviously that has limitations um, and we certainly don't want to put anybody over a financial burden simply to reuse a building because it was more effective to go green build but um, in my view where we can reuse where we can adapt um, and make ready for whatever type of space we need to me seems the better path uh, but sometimes that may require thinking outside the box as, as Mike mentioned right it, you may have a clustering of warehouses and maybe only one of them is really suited to support large scale EV charging or has the ability to do what you need. It may require some different sorts of partnerships and agreements and working across company lines that weren't traditionally done before to get to the desired outcome. And that just takes people coming to the table thinking differently to get to a common outcome. So. One, one of the trends that we're seeing pretty strongly in the warehousing side, not necessarily manufacturing, but in warehousing is sort of a, a um, flight to the extremes. And what I mean by that is we see uh, a lot of desire for very, very large central warehouses and then a large number of small, uh, you know, distributed warehouses close to urban centers. Um, and so I think sort of the mid-sized warehouse, um, you know, starts to become less common and you sort of have either these, you know, mega warehouses or these, these micro warehouses. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how that lines up 
uh, with uh, existing stock, but that's certainly one of the um, trends that we're seeing with our customer base. Yeah, I would add to that too, what Daniel said is um, one of the trends we're also seeing is in the existing stock is kind of the reinvention of that space. So, you know, there, there are going to be geographic areas that no longer serve the real estate or commercial real estate needs as it relates, relates to that type of warehouse. Um, and those types of warehouses are being reused, like Paul kind of mentioned, for other types of uses. They're being broken down into smaller spaces that are accommodating some type of work-life event or, um, or even a smaller space that accommodates some type of storefront retail. Um, I think that in some of the states and particularly in Colorado where we're located right now, where I am, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of reuse for these warehouse spaces as it relates to things like pot growing. Um, and those are high, high energy intensive uses. And, um, and so as these new tenants come into these spaces, they are looking at ways to adapt them um, and strategize around kind of, you know, their most greatest expense, which is energy use and their utility bill and, and focusing on that piece. So I think there is a lot of opportunity to reuse what we have, but the, you know, goods and services are going to continue to grow as our population expands. And so, you know, I have a good sense that we're probably also going to be building new warehouse stock. Um, and it's also going to be located in probably different areas it wasn't located in before. Um, great, Mike. Any, any other? Any no, I, no, I don't have. I don't. I, I mean, I think that um, w one thing that's being talked about is the the some of the locations of big distribution centers now, and that they're a little too close to over you know over po or populated areas. And so, do we move some of those warehouses? Maybe it's some of those big ones out. We have big trucks that go warehouse to warehouse, and little trucks go. Uh, you know, more intrastity city and from suburb, suburban to intrastity. city, where in, in history, we just let the big trucks come all the way in and deliver to the stores right in the urban community. Maybe there's a, uh, and we, we believe there's a movement there that might have an effect on how reusable some of these warehouses are as we look at uh, the future. Great. And um, because we are talking about decarbonization and all of that and how and where and why things move. Um, the 500 mile rule uh, often comes up and is that still in play in the future? You know, uh, everyone sort of danced around and the obvious environmental benefit is the less driving we're doing, the better it is. So what's the 500 mile rule look like? And I will defer to one of our experts to give a much more eloquent explanation of what the 500 mile rule is uh, for our audience. Or maybe you each have your own take on it. Be that, that, that's a solid Mike question. <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure about the 500 mile rule, but I will I will say this and I said it in my comments a bit that, you know, um, if we can get we, we know that truck drivers want to be home um, every night. And we are, given those tools that I mentioned earlier around GPS and a lot of other tools, we now can can more confidently drive the 500 miles, you know, 250 miles out, 250 miles back and confidently get them home. And we need to do that now because we do have ELDs in every truck. I mean, no longer can you fudge that a little bit and, and you know, and drive a little bit over the hours of service. So, um, so I think it's firmly in place. If that's the 500 mile rule you're talking about, I think that's very firmly in place. Um, it could be, ex of course, um, blown up with automated trucks. So, you know, if we get to a place where, you know, that 500 mile rule is only because of hours of service for the driver. And if we have situations, warehouse to warehouse, other kinds of um, uh, routes that um, end up being driverless, then, you know, it becomes a different story. But um, no, it's, it's, it's firmly there. And I think growing uh, with respect to knowing where the electric infrastructure can be put. And having that dedicated route back and forth is much more desirable for truck drivers who um, can get home to families and confidently get home to other other activities, um, which is becoming more and more important. We we see. We probably have time for one or two more questions. If anyone wants to pop those in to the Q and A. Um, but separately, as we look, 
that's not for this. Uh, do any of our panelists have questions of each other? I mean, it's not often that we get such a wonderful brain trust. And do you all have questions of each other as long as we're all here? Uh, Bobby, I was just going to add to a little bit what Mike was saying. Um, uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, primarily about the electrification of uh, our trucking fleets. As as things start to move towards autonomy, um, again, I think part of the challenge is we tend to think of this all or nothing scenario, which is unlikely to be the case. Um, uh, you know, either it's fully autonomous or it has a driver. The most likely scenario is that we use autonomy to extend the ranges with which drivers, you know, particularly in long haul trucking situations, uh, can drive because, um, you know, it's it's more of a shared autonomy approach where the driver needs to be there. But you know, when you get into that um, uh, onto that autonomy autonomy approved lane on the highway and the truck sort of locks into that. The driver doesn't really need to do anything. The driver could even take a nap at that point. But um, you know, if if there is a need uh, for the driver for whatever reason, and obviously at the beginning and the ends, and you know, stuff happens along the way. I I don't think we're going to get rid of the drivers anytime soon. But I think we're going to use autonomy to allow those drivers to do more than they could before. I yeah, very much agreed. So I, I've got a question for Paul. I mean, Paul, when we look at like 10, 15, 50 trucks, I mean, we're we're definitely talking about, you know, a, a situation where we need new service and and many times. Um, so do, do you see in your mind, do you see um, where like a fleet has, you know, five distribution centers? Do you think they're going to go electric trucks in one fast and, you know, kind of replace all their, I don't know, pick a number, 20, 30, 40 diesel trucks with all electric fast, because it'll make sense to do that at that location, or will they do a little bit at each of the five distribution centers and kind of work their way slowly to an electric fleet? So all in at one distribution center or a little at a time? Um, I think I think we have companies working both ends of that. There are some companies who are going to do it very, very rapidly. Uh, you know, you have some companies who are committed by 2030 to have an all EV fleet, which is very ambitious, and they have over 100,000 vehicles in the country. And you have other folks saying, hey, I want to take a more reserved kind of wait and see approach because they have a large vested infrastructure in traditional diesel fueled fleets. And so it's like, geez, I don't want to get rid of an asset I just bought. Um, so I think they're going to take a wait. Some will take a wait and see and see how it goes. And some are going to go extremely quick. I wish there was a simple answer on that. Well, and and from a you know just a quick question from a, a project management at a warehouse, what would be better with the, with respect to working with utility and putting these things in place and so forth? Slower, slower would definitely be better. It gives us more time to plan, gives the utility more time to accommodate and get the resources there that we need. Um, some companies are shifting to green build distribution centers where we can plan for that capacity day one in those new facilities. Uh, but definitely the, the more time we have to plan, the obviously the better it's going to be. And I have one sort of last question, and this probably is more in the Paul department than anyone else's, but you know, knowing that if we're thinking about electrifying robotics in the interior, we're thinking about electrifying our fleets, are our utilities prepared for this electricity load? Uh, the simple answer is no, because they, they are seeing uh, requests for electricity on an unprecedented scale, like in the state of Washington, for example, where um, you're going to see fossil fuels phased out probably at a much faster pace than any other state potentially in the country, which great for, for uh, global warming. Um, that puts a stress on utility companies that are already stressed to the limit with distribution and capacity and planning. And then you put on top of that going to EVSC fleets uh, and other things. So they are rapidly reaching out to help figure out like, how can I bend down the demand on my distribution network? How can we work together? And, and a lot of that is, you know, look to renewables, look to battery storage, look to see where you can help your utility company bend down the demand on those feeders so they don't have to go and build, you know, tens of millions of dollars of new infrastructure. So that'll take a lot of collaboration a lot of out-of-the-box thinking, 
a lot of different ways of looking at things operationally where the norm for operational hours is probably going to have to shift to work better to get to a common outcome than what we're used to today. Great. Uh, one last whip around. Any final closing thoughts from each of you in a minute or less? Uh, I would just say that it's a really exciting time, uh, you know, in our history. Um, there's a convergence of so many exciting technologies that uh, uh, really important, I think, for these type of, uh, you know, um, industries to really roll the clock forward. Uh, you know, I was in a, a meeting today um, and uh, part of the discussion we had was, you know, the human brain thinks very linearly. And so when we predict the future, we sort of predict the future very linearly. Um, but the rate of change is, is increasing and will continue to increase. And so as, as a lot of these different technologies start to converge, uh, you know, the way we operate as a society is going to continue to change so quickly that um, uh, really important to, again, just embrace this idea of flexibility and resilience. Um, it, you know, if, uh, if you have a crystal ball, let me borrow it. But, um, uh, you know, I think the, the only thing that you can really count on is that your thoughts about how the future is going to play out are wrong, and we need to be ready for that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Daniel. And I would say that one thing this pandemic has taught us is really how to become more resilient and evolve through that changing process as humans. And I think that we're going to continue to see or be faced with more and more of that, and particularly as it relates to the built environment. Um, you know, right now, currently, the political environment is in favor of this advancement and this change that we're hoping to see to kind of make everything a little bit better. Um, but that can also change um, like everything else in the next couple of years. But I think that we all just kind of need to, to embrace what we're calling, I don't know, the, the exit from the pandemic portal and the new normal and really define what that resilience piece means for us to sustain um, the long term. Yeah, you know, the, the old saying, lead, follow, or get out of the way. I'm, I'm not so sure we're going to have a choice. I think um, particularly even warehouses and some of these depots, I mean, there's going to be a decision by the trucking company or the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the manufacturer or the goods movement that we're going to put electric trucks here and we're going to do it maybe slower or faster, Paul and my discussion a few minutes ago. And so, uh, you know, I, I think... Um, you know, like I said earlier, I think it's important to predict and really own whether you think that's going to happen next year, five years, 10 years down the road, and then really put in place actions. But but just um, you can get run over pretty quick or really have a, a challenge in front of you if you're not ready for, for uh, both automation and electrification, I think, with respect to what we're talking about here. Yeah, I, I'd echo all the sentiments. I like Mike's kind of like, you know, be bold, uh, go out there and do it. Um, because I think a lot of those companies that go out and do that and want to, and are bold about doing it will capture a lot of that market and be seen as the innovative leaders. And in, this is how you do it. Um, but it's a it's super exciting time, like Sarah said, to be, especially an engineer, we're looking at a lot of new and different and creative ways of doing things that, you know, as little as five or six years ago, just weren't out there. So technology is catching up. Um, super fun time to be an engineer. Yeah, I, I love that, Paul. The be bold statement is great. You know, the, the wait and see approach, it's not a winning strategy anymore. Right. Just not going to work. Well, Mike, Daniel, Sarah, Paul, thank you all so much. Thank you all for attending. Um, we will be sending out a uh, recorded link um, or a link to the recording uh, after this presentation. If you are interested in joining us for session three, uh, which is focused on retrofitting our buildings, please feel free to email Lindsay Vendania. Her email is up on the screen. Uh, and with that, thank you all. Have a great day.